church today by playing our original bells in a change ring pattern. Please stand and join me in the response of Paul for worship. <laughs> this is the day the Lord has made. Let us Beginnings, and so we're, uh, we're always in need of bell choir and ringers. So uh, Wednesday evenings we meet. I uh, would like to share, stand at my pulpit for a second, some thoughts about uh, the long suffering for some. Celebrating for others, time that the 50-year members have experienced. I'm going to start uh, back in 1961, prior to uh, Mr. Mitchell joining, but the year of your wedding, nonetheless. That was when the Lockport Presbyterian Home opened up. 1961, the Williams House. In 1963, Keenan Center began the planning. 65, the narthex was remodeled and 
Dr. Keenan passed away and left his home and grounds to First Presbyterian Church. 1967, I was born. Oh, but also, interfaith, peanut brittle began. And someone gave me some peanut brittle from 1967. It's in my office. Uh, I just ate some of it. No, I'm just kidding. Keep House was added to the Presbyterian home, and the set session turns the management of the Keenan Center over to the Community Based Board of Governors. And we do have several Board of Governor members uh, who are also elders of our church who will continue to serve on that board. Deacons in 1971 sponsored the Lockport Meals on Wheels. 1971 Happy Times Daycare Center opens. 1973 the, 19, the 150th anniversary history was published. 1976 was the bicentennial, bicentennial. And I remember getting all those uh, those poppies. Remember those poppies? Did anyone get the poppies that you put on your? I guess I was the only one. But also, the college scholarship funds were established. 1979, First Presbyterian hosted Alcoholics Anonymous, and the Vang family from Vietnam was sponsored. 1980, release time religious education ends. And so now kids are forced to stay at school and not come to learn about religion. 1986, the Fountain of Youth was established for junior highs. 1987, Operation 21 remodeling was completed for the total cost of $377,000. 1988, 84 Ontario Street was purchased and the first domestic violence shelter in Lockport was opened. 1991, Hamilton House remodeling begins and the Chinas begin. 1998, Stephen Ministries begins. 1999, the chapel was remodeled and was named after Reverend Malby Babcock. That's only until 1999. But you've also experienced numerous new pastors that have come and gone. Some of you would have remembered Stephen Palmer, who was here from 1936 to 1962. Some may remember W. James Westhaver, who also, by the way, Reminds me of my own name, W. James Hardy. He was here from 1962 to 1984. William Hathaway, who was born on March 13th, the same birthday as myself, came in 1985 and stayed until 1999. And then you've had a series of other pastors that have been here, uh, Reverend Paul Couch, uh, and then numerous interims. People may remember Agnes Watson. Some may remember Reverend Hills. Some may remember Steve Devine. Some may remember Bob Peck. Some remember, may remember some of the fine associate pastors like Ike Orloff, Lori Tabiri, or Cindy Parr. And I was reminded of Herbert Christ, or Christ, if you wanted to call him that, or Woodrow, Woodrow Whitmer. There have been many fine pastors and activities that have been started at this church, and many continue to grow and develop even to this day. We have been blessed with things like the Dollar Dinners that has opened, the Clothes Closet. We have been speaking with a group of Spanish-speaking 
Christians who would like to worship here on Sunday evenings. There are numerous ministry activities that continue on, like the crosswalk that First Presbyterian Church is very active in, or the, or the crop walk, which again, First Presbyterian has been interested in and has been active in. There has been times when the youth have gone to Montreat, and we've had wonderful congregational picnics where there's been swimming and joyous gatherings together. And as I said, we at Leader House last year punctured our pool and the water flowed out. She's not here though to defend herself. We've had some wonderful and exciting things happen in 50 years. Not to mention people who have passed away that we've loved, people who have been married, people who have moved away to other parts of the country, people who have been lost for a variety of reasons and have been missed. This church has grown, declined, regrown, rebirthed, and has been through many things. To be a member for at least 50 years immediately will tell me about someone's personality. Now, the first intuition when someone says that they've been a member of one church for 50 years, the first intuition, and tell me that you might not think of this in your head, is they've got to be a little bit nuts, right? They've got to be a little bit loopy, because why would they be here for so long, be so dedicated to one church when there's been such change over the years? And I'm sure some of you have probably sat in those pews for 50 years and said to yourself, Right? Why am I still here? There may have been a sermon that was so incredibly dull that you probably felt like you slept for 50 years and woke up and said, oh my goodness, I'm still here, right? But the dedication that it takes to be a member of one church when a church goes through change and goes through turmoil, goes through conflict, goes to reconciliation, tells me a little bit about the loopiness of the individuals that stay. But it also tells me of the faithfulness, of the commitment, of the ability to stick to something even when at times it can be a struggle. To me, that is a recognition not only of what you have, but what God has blessed you with. Churches are an amazing institution. You know, churches can be a place where you can find, even in one day, on one Sunday, great joy and great sadness all mixed in together. It can be a time when you can be angry at someone when you walk in the door and be inspired to do good things. It can be a place where you can build up the body of Christ single-handedly and feel like you are part of a community and a family. The church can be a place where you can watch little kids ringing bells with an earnest look of love and joy in their hearts and you can see it transformed in their very faces and it can be a place where you can watch the love of your life being wheeled down in a coffin and you can say to yourself, I may never be able to enter that church again because all I can think of is the loss that I have suffered and then to find that someone the next day from church calls you up and says, I love you, let's do something together because I too have felt lost. The church can be a place where tears are shed, where laughter is, is bursting forth. It can be an incredibly frustrating experience where you're sitting in a meeting and you're thinking, will that pastor Jim party ever shut up? <laughs> it can be a place of great prayer. Please, dear God, make him shut up. 
but it can be a place of great prayer. Dearest God, I love you. Thank you for the blessings that you have given me. The church is a place where we tell our stories each and every day. Remember, long ago, 1992, I was in Salt Lake City, and at the time, the first African-American woman was uh, lifted up and installed as the moderator of the Presbyterian Church USA, and she preached a sermon. And at the end of her sermon, she sang a song. I'm not going to do it nearly as well as she did, but you're going to bear with me nonetheless. Went like this. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood.